What's up, release. guys? Release. My name is Cyrus. This man over here. I don't know which side you're on. I'm, is, I'm on this side. <laughs> is Alex. Yes, I'm Alex. And we are just two bros who decided we we're going to record some shit and slap together a podcast. This is our trial episode, I guess. We don't even have a name confirmed, so. Yeah, for real. <laughs> it's a pilot episode, though. We're just kind of freestyling it. Um, to be to be fair, I, I've been I, I don't know about Cyrus, right? I'm sure I'm sure he'll relate to this, but I've been wanting to start a podcast for some time now. Um, but sometimes we just get stuck, right? And sometimes we just need to take that leap regardless of how it comes out, right? We just got to do it and then just post it. And then it's just a rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Yes. Until, <laughs> okay. Until we Honestly, got it down. this could just be the topic. It doesn't have to be fucking like we had to talk about blah, 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 blah. Like, because I know many people want to start shit, but they, you know, number one, they don't know how to do it. Number two, you know, the, the self doubt and the like how the I, I like the, the the fear and and the of stepping into that and number three is i feel like a lot of the times people they don't they don't know someone else who also shares a similar vision so then it feels like mm -hmm. they they they're all alone in that but luckily i, I met you that's true um that's true and we're just doing that's true thing. man i mean we've only we've had maybe like two calls three two or three yeah, I think calls. We had two yeah before like before this one and um we kind of we we kind of met through like x right um but there wasn't a lot of engagement until we hopped on those calls but you can just kind of tell when there's that natural kind of connection with certain people right it's like yeah you get a we it i mean x has a great uh com network right but there's just certain people where it's like after that first call you're just like I like this guy, you know, and like, like, like you guys are both so aligned on many things. Um, and that's, that's how it felt like when I hopped on a call with Cyrus, that call was so natural since the first call, we were like, this should have been a podcast episode. <laughs> yeah. In the middle of the call, I was like, I should be recording this right now. <laughs> like, the topics are worth it. I, I don't know about you, but like when it's recording, I feel like the flow is a little bit like. I'm a little off guard by it. it is Definitely. It, I think they should do they should do a feature where it's like it hides the fact that it's recording. It out, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or less obvious because you just see that recording and it's red, right? Yeah. So it's just kind of sticking and there's just this thought of like, oh, you're being recorded. This is gonna be posted. And it's like sometimes that interferes with with interaction. I, I agree. Well, at the end of the day, I think, yeah, let's just, we'll just talk to each other, see, see what comes up. Um, yeah. And there's going to be more episodes to come too. Yeah. It'll be fun to look back at this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Zizan. Zizan. Um, I just felt neutral today not like uh him not like a her hmm. z that's okay to feel yeah. neutral i think a lot of the times we need to feel like we have to chase positivity or happiness or a positive positive mental mm -hmm. state and then it just mm -hmm. makes us it makes us unhappy chasing happiness and sometimes being neutral is a beautiful thing. I agree. I don't think we need pronouns for them, but neutrality is <laughs> is definitely good. I, you know, actually, you speaking about neutrality, like, I think sometimes we just need to be like non-reactive to things, right? I'm speaking like from experience right now, like this past week. Um, I've just been feeling like super anxious, right? Mm. And it's like when you're in a in a state of anxiety, 
it's just like the decision making is not not great right um but it wasn't until like you know the even today honestly like i was feeling kind of anxious but like right now like you speaking about neutrality like it's just this state of like non-reactiveness i guess is what i'm trying to say it's it's like something happens but you give a uh what's the word a buffer you don't immediately react to the thing that happens to you right but you kind of just experience it first and then see what what appropriate step you think should be taken um right so re responding rather than reacting mm -hmm. and that's the exactly. core of self-awareness and meditation if 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 i can ask was there anything in particular that kind of caught you off guard this past week or anything you can point to or it's just just because i know sometimes for me it's just the feeling comes out of nowhere and I, I almost can't quite describe like why am i feeling it i just do mm -hmm. and then i can also get into a tangle of like trying to be a de detective and be like okay why am i feeling this way <laughs> um <laughs> that's true yeah i mean politics bro that's all it is mm. <laughs> i just it's very helpful to have, I guess, positive friends, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to say I don't have positive friends, right? But it's just exposing yourself to a lot of like negativity. Um, I mean, I, it, it sounds kind of obvious, but it's like you'll start to feel very negative, right? Um, so like I've been kind of just going down like rabbit holes of, of what's going on in the world right um because because i i care right and it, it's just sad of what's occurring in the world in the world right now right um and it's like a, a part of me wants to like do something about it right but the thing is it's like it constantly exposing myself to that news right right even though yes it's happening um it's like it, it almost leaves me in a paralyzed state Right. So I guess there needs to be a balance. Right. Because I, I also for me personally, I don't want to fully neglect like what's going on, because, um, again, I care about these topics and I feel like addressing them is important. But it's like, again, bringing it back to balance, going too far on either end. Right. And this in my case, it was just consuming too much, I guess, negative news it just started making me feel very like depressed, anxious. Right. Um, but you kind of snapped me out. Like before this call, like when we decided, you know, we had a conversation we decided we were going to do this podcast. Right. You kind of snapped me out of that, uh, paralysis mode a bit. Right. Mm. Um, you tend to have a very optimistic view of things. Right. Sometimes. I, I usually do <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Maybe you see it, it it varies, right? Because sometimes I, I've, in my family, I tend to be the most optimistic, but it's like these past two, three weeks, it hasn't been like that. Um, but again, bringing it back, it, it is important to, to kind of balance that out. Like, even though, yes, there's bad news happening, it's like we can still look through good things, right? Like gratitude is a great tool for me, right? Just appreciating, um, I guess everything, even the, the simple things, especially, um, kind of brings me back to a more neutral state versus a very anxious and reactive state. Politics is something else. I always joke that <laughs> the second thing as controversial as politics is nutrition. <laughs> but <laughs> That's hilarious. I mean, you talk about politics, you're in the US, I'm in Canada. Yeah. It's a it's a fucking shit show. I mean, I don't know if you're comfortable yeah. talking about this specific detail. Like personally for me, I don't give a fuck. I'll talk about it, but <laughs> I don't care either. I don't care either. Yeah. That's um, that's exactly why I put the 
the pronouns. But, I mean, right, <laughs> right. But I, I think what it's so funny because I almost like on YouTube when I'm scrolling through YouTube, the po political videos get get uh, recommended to me, and I watch it as entertainment rather than than something to get mad over. Now it's just like. Like, what the fuck am I watching? Like, is this actual reality? <laughs> you know, it, it feels like a reality show. And the, the funny thing that I've I also agree. joked about is that it, it, we've gotten to the point where it feels like the world and its politics is has become so absurd that you can't even create a reality show that can match it in its in its drama, in its suspense, in its <laughs> Yeah. Like, the world feels unreal. And I know that like that might create a lot of anxiety, but for me I I like I find a lot of relief in that. In the sense of like it's not that serious, you know. We put on this act of like, you know, it's all serious and you know, the world's going to hell and you know, all these wars are going on and all the conflict and all of this mm. stuff. And yes, it is atrocious at one level, but it's like are, are we as individuals ready to step out of it? Because it's it's almost like the carnivores, in a sense, the carnivores fuel the vegans and the vegans fuel the carnivores just as the left creates the right and the right creates the left. And mm -hmm. when you're identified with one side, you're going to create, you're going to come at a crossroads with the other side because you're fundamentally fighting against another side you know it's like which side is right and which side is wrong yeah in a certain sense like what does it matter you know both sides have a certain truth to them that is true and they also have a certain falsity that is false and i think it's like getting too caught up inside the drama not realizing it's a drama it's like watching a movie or watching a drama. You know, you have the anta the protagonist and the antagonist. And, antagonist. you know, you, you want the protagonist to win so bad. But sometimes it's like, it's not so clear. It's like, who is the protagonist here? Are you so sure you are the protagonist? And right, I think this goes back. So this is one of the topics in spirituality that, that me and Alex have talked about is this need to, would you rather be right or be free? Because these two are very different things. Mm -hmm. You know, we try to justify our existence. It, it, we think that if I'm right about this, then I'm justified to tell you how to behave. But that does not respect our sovereignty as individuals. And that is a sense of Im imposing. That is a sense of enslavement. Um, it's like, what can we accept to not, can we agree to not agree? I think that's fundamentally the issue because when we can do that, I think, I, I think peace becomes a, a more natural byproduct because we're not fighting against it, but we're seeing, we're seeing two coins of reality instead of just, just the one coin that, that we are mentally confined in. And, and I think it's a big trap that politics and nutrition can get us into. <laughs> No, that's that's true, man. And and on back to that point of agreeing to disagree, I do. I also I also do believe that's like fundamentally the issue, right? We've become so divided, and I feel like the way we perceive identity, right, is so boxed, right? It's it's what you said. It's like we we attribute our identity to these labels, right? So it's like, oh, if you're a leftist, then you have to agree to all these points, all this agenda, right? For, same with the right. If you're like more like conservative, you have to agree to all all these points, right? But in reality, that I, that's that's not the case, right? It's like me, even us right here, right? We can agree on many points, and I'm sure we're gonna disagree on on other points, right? But humans are more, they're more complex than just labels and, and boxes, right? Um, I think there would be more conversation happening and unity if, if we were more open to disagreeing um, 
not trying to force the other side to believe like this is the way, right? Because that that's not going to happen. It's like I have my beliefs, you have your beliefs. Uh, this other person has their beliefs, right? It's like the goal isn't to change each other's mind. I mean, it could happen, but it shouldn't be the the main goal, right? I, I think conversation and sharing ideas and discussing these t- uh, these topics is so much more productive and, and more learning can actually happen too. But it's like, I, I feel like that's, that's kind of dying in a sense. It's like, oh, it, it, he said something that, that I don't agree with, or that's like offended me or something. And it's like, I, I hate that person. I don't want to talk to that person anymore. Um, and I don't know, I think it's truthfully, I think it's created a, a toxic culture in a way, because I want to talk with people that disagree with me. I want to hear their perspective, right? But but in a respectful and civilized manner, right? I see these videos where it's just, it's debating has just, it's not even debates anymore. It's just people just insulting each other, getting super loud and and trying to, like that. that's apparently winning. Like, I don't know, it's just weird. It's all, it's all, it's all change there. Right. I think the, you can't really come to a resolution without understanding. And that's the the problem there is, you know, when neither side wants to understand, but just wants to hurl insults and, Mm -hmm. and keep closed off. Then it's almost in that sense, it's impossible to come to a resolution or an understanding. Um, I had a thought and then I forgot it. Hmm. Well, yeah, so there's one idea, or I guess a question to you, right? So I I do agree with what we were saying about agreeing to disagree, right? But where do those boundaries exist in terms of like, tolerance, right? Like, being too tolerant can sometimes be destructive to like, society as a whole right well i think i think a big problem stems from the unwillingness to to listen the unwillingness to act have an actual dialogue because the the Mm -hmm. ego the defensive mechanism if you feel insecure about something is you're going to want to shut down any opposition You don't even Mm -hmm. want, you know, ideally you don't even want uh, like opposing opinion to be able to express itself in the first place. Uh, I think this is where like ideology becomes dangerous because this goes back to what we were talking about from the beginning is when we are stuck in these mental boxes and labels of identities, it can become a very dangerous trap because it's not even necessarily our own opinions. It's what it's the opinions that have been handed to us and prescribed mm-hmm. to us that we are now a messenger of the ideology and we're going to do all that we can to defend it because we mistake the belief with our identity. Mm-hmm. I don't, in a sense, what we believe is who we are in a sense. That's true. But, but, uh, in another sense, it's not true because we're not confined by our beliefs. And I think there's a certain sense of comfort in not not being authentic so that you can you can you can fit into a, a group, some form of in-group or ideology. Um, mm-hmm. because what's scarier than being alone with an opinion that no one else shares with you? Right. So mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, it's, it's, well, it's like the same thing with, if, you know, if, are you finding a, if you find a nine to five job, it's like, well, most people don't do it because they want to, but because it's, it's mm-hmm. safe. It's safer than, than creating something that's, you know, unique. And that's, that's, 
of it's safer than stepping into that authentic version of yourself where maybe you don't even know what you want to do. But if you can admit that, I think that is the first step to, to actually becoming your freest self rather than conforming to an image of what you think you should be. And I know this, this is going all over the place. Now we're going into like mm -hmm. yeah. authenticity, but, yeah, but I think that's the right. interesting thing is that you can't separate these areas or these topics um, because well, they're labels and mm -hmm. it's, I think when we're afraid to be truly ourselves and authentic in, in our uniqueness, it's much easier. The bottom line is that it's much easier to flock to a predefined set of ideas. So that way we don't even have to think for ourselves and what we believe as our freest expression. Mm -hmm. So then we're afraid to speak out against the gospel because the gospel in this sense is God. God is a religion. God is a a belief system god is a political party god is a nutritional diet right <laughs> but what but the the fundamental mistake to me is when we outsource god to some kind of external entity we give all our power away the power is within us mm -hmm. you know christ said the kingdom of heaven is within but men go seeking it outside <laughs> Damn, man. I'm still chewing on those ideas. Oh, chew. Take your time. You got all the time. That's the thing. There's no rush. We're not in a rush to get anywhere. And when we're so mm -hmm. anxious, we're, when we're so anxious, like, this must happen. You know, we, we have to control everything and, and make sure that it happens our way. That is the source of all the suffering and all the anxiety. Yeah. A big part of it. So I'm trying to think of the ideas you said, because the ego is one of one of them. Right. And that is. Um, that's part of that's part of the problem, I would say. Right. It's like um, I would say overall. Right. A lot. And, and I'm speaking from my perspective, too, because I. I fell, uh, fell in this category too, um, but it's a very, I guess we're, we're very insecure. And so at attaching ourselves to a identity or label kind of not fully removes that, but masks that insecurity, right? Right. And then especially, cause you, you don't really truly work on the on the insecurity um and i say it. that because it's like you you see yeah you see all these like labels and these you know groups of people right um but it's what you said it's like as soon as you say something that kind of shatters the their reality right it's like they become very defensive very dis defensive but that's like that what you were saying it's 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 that ego um mechanism right um because it feels like an attack directly to you right but it's like not nah, it's an attack at the idea right it's it's right. like not nah, i'm not right. trying to right it's just challenging the idea um but but the thing is it's like if you're just so attached to that that label ideology what you're saying right it feels like a personal attack yes yes you're on point with that. And that reminded me of the Descartes because the West, the whole Western metaphysics and belief system, like at, at our core is from Descartes. I think, therefore I am. So then we start identifying what we think with who we are. And that's, that's the, the identification with, with the mind, with, you know, whatever label you want to call it. Ego is just another label. Right. But, but the, the Eastern, the Eastern way, which is, counter to the western belief is i am therefore i think there's something within you that gives rise to your capacity to think but 
it's not what you think isn't you because who are you like who is the the what is the thing that's thinking um in the sense of like what's beating your heart and what's allowing your lungs to breathe and you might say well that's me doing it but when you're not doing it then who's doing it right like it's mm-hmm. that source it's that god source that all these ancient philosophies point to and you know things like meditation things like breath work things like exercise things like doing extreme sports you know you think about a time where you got out of your head you got out of your head and you're just flowing with the moment right you call that flow state you call that following in falling in love where you're completely out of your mind and it feels like life is happening through you that's who you are when when you're not stuck here and i think you know because we're so stressed all the time you know we we think of ways to control our life um and this happens whether that's at the individual level at the interpersonal level familial relationship level community level political level mm-hmm. they're just micro to macro versions of this how i perceive it and when we don't feel safe when we don't feel accepting of this moment when when we're caught up in stress we start looking for ways to control things we start fighting we start fighting this moment we start fighting what shows up so it doesn't even have to be another political party that we're fighting it could be as simple as this moment you know i hate my life i'm miserable i want to get out of this shit hole so i'm fighting i'm fighting i'm fighting i'm fighting my reality mhm and this was the way that i used to operate dominantly you know this is why i got started going to the gym i hated my body i hated how i looked i wanted i'm like you're fucking ugly damn it i'm going to change you right but it's not from a place of i'm doing this because you know i want to express my physical body to its fullest capacity and realize my potential out of love for myself but i'm doing it because i am trying to fight the current reality that i'm in and i think it's this shift that eases all the anxiety and all the conflict and when you ease it within yourself you start to realize how it translates into the people you interact with at every level mm-hmm. as within so without hmm Yeah man. <laughs> That's a lot to unpack. <laughs> yeah, I said a lot. <laughs> no, no, that's good, man. That's good. Man, you know, a lot of anxiety and stress, it's I'll try to articulate this as best as I can, right? But through like a visual, it anxiety and stress to me feels like holding on to like so many things like internally. That's what it feels like, right? but it's like as soon as you just uh you just surrender mm. it's like i don't know at least from my experience that's what really helped i mean i i'm coming from a christian kind of perspective right i i'm i've grown into christian faith but i'm exploring i'm exploring faith i'm exploring other areas as well right um but the idea of just surrendering to to God or right or just that feeling of surrender and just letting life happen to you versus control like i i i don't know it's like we we can control what we can control right but it's like we can't control everything and and i think that's what happens to me it's like i want to control everything like like for example i care so much about my family right that i i want to control like our our their like not only my diet but their diets as well i i exercising a sleep schedule like all these things right but that causes me so much extra stress and anxiety when it's like uh it's like i got to be more patient and just kind of if anything i think it's probably better just to focus on myself kind of sh- let it show by example in a way right 
and then over time just just have faith that that it's it's that reality is going to catch up and they're going to start making better food decisions they're going to start exercising more um and it's like it's uh, bringing it back to control right it's like i want to control all these little elements but it's like i can't control my dad's or my mom's or my even my little sister's like decisions i just can't right um i can only control i mean how we react i mean even certain events that happen to us we can't control right we just have to control how we react to it that's that's as um that i mean that's that's where a lot of our power comes or a lot of our control comes but yeah I, bringing back to that anxiety and stress it's like i felt that relief that relief of anxiety and stress once i kind of just surrendered and it's like just again letting life unfold unfold in front of me right versus trying to to control every aspect of it because that from my experience that hasn't really worked in my favor it's taking the leap of faith and it's it's funny because when you start to embody the calmness and the groundedness other people start to they feel it they feel your energy and it's almost like because you're not forcing them to behave in a certain way they suddenly they suddenly untense a little more they suddenly relax a little more and it's not because you force them to it's because of your your own embodiment of the energy of of that um faith is the hardest leap because it's a leap we take or don't take in every moment and to me like what is falling in love what is flow state it's all they are is taking the leap of faith in every moment um and what does taking the leap of faith mean? Well, it's it's that surrender you're talking about. It's like you're on the top of a cliff, you know, looking down and you're cliff diving. Um, or you're at the pool and you're on a 25-footer diving board. It's like you can, we spend so much time in our head, you know, at the top, in our head, worrying about what might happen and trying to control <laughs> when really... Once our foot steps off of that ledge, the control is let go of. And we're in that free fall. And that's the moment of ecstasy. It's that moment. Why do we chase orgasms? Why do we, <laughs> you know, why do we want to accomplish big, shiny achievements? We want to feel that hit of just bliss and ecstasy. You know, why do we party? Why do we drink? And then, you know, if you're ever at a club, you know, you're drunk and you're on Molly and whatever, you're grinding against, you know, somebody else. It's that euphoria. It's that indescribable feeling because you're out of your mind and you're just flowing with life mm. and it doesn't matter what word you use it you know flow falling in love taking the leap of faith having an orgasm i think fundamentally it's like we're so deeply craving that kind of experience well it's it's mm. liberation uh, salvation whatever label you want to put mm. on it when when in the rare moments in our lives when we have those i think that's what we spend our whole lives trying to come back to and one of the ways we do it is we try to control things but the ironic thing is that 
that's what's stopping us from it. And it's like, how, what would life feel like if your whole life or more of your life could be felt in that state of euphoria and ecstasy where you lose your sense of self and you're just like in love with the moment? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're all looking for. I agree, and, man. Did you have any other thoughts on that? And the thing is that you can create that. And this is what all mm -hmm. the ancient philosophies with, you know, the, the practices and the, their tools to get you to that realization. You know, you mm -hmm. want to call it, like I said, you want to call it liberation. You want to call it salvation. You want to call it inner peace. You want to kind of end of suffering, but like, doesn't matter. It's just, Mm -hmm. That state is what we're all searching for, but we right. can get there if we center in on that part of ourselves that is here. Dude, I think as a society, we, we just haven't learned, right? Because we're, we're all capable of doing it, but we haven't learned how to live presently right living in the present moment um there's so much peace in the present moment um oh yeah I, I remember what i was gonna say so i don't smoke weed anymore right but i used to heavily smoke weed and i kind of had a realization recently that a big part of why i was doing it was because it was, well, I was coping, right? And I was trying to like, that. that's part of it. I, I was trying to uh, run away from my problems. But another aspect to it was that it helped me be present, right? It, it like zoomed me into the present tense. Like I, I wasn't thinking about past regrets. And then I wasn't thinking about in, uh, anxious future events, right? Um, and so it just zoomed me into the present moment and it's like, you know, I would eat food and it, I would, I would taste it and it would taste better. Right. Um, I'd, I'd play video games or I even like, even the smallest things were more fun under the influence. Right. Um, but then you realize it's like, you don't, you don't need that though. Like it, it's like, you can do that without the substance. Um, and that's what I've been practicing more and more, right? right? Just being so much more grateful and, and appreciating the now, right? When I sit down, when I'm drinking my coffee, really savoring each sip, right? Um, just looking around, really just being more aware of, of what's happening and, and actually taking it in uh during that during that time during the the present right and i mean for me it's like i i just felt like i didn't need the weed anymore i mean it was causing honestly it was causing more anxiety on top of that i mean i want to live a long life so it's like <laughs> i'm trying to keep my my health um optimal but yeah, I, I, you speaking about that kind of just brought that brought that up that I think a lot of people get intoxicated because it's it's like our life is so shit outside of that. And it's like intoxicating kind of just brings you back to like what life's all about, right? Like building memories and 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 creating connections with relationships with people and like I mean, what even, what even is life, right? It's just like this experience that we're having and uh, it's like an, uh, a personal experience, but then there's also like a, a community experience to it too um, that, that we share. And I think a lot of that is missing, right? Because we're just so caught up with like work. We're so caught up with like career and, and going to college and like 
all these like things and they just we we completely forget about the now right what's happening now um and i think substances do that very well in terms of like bringing like forget everything imposed on you right and then you just kind of live live in that present moment for a for like a temporary moment of course there's other drawbacks to to substances but yeah what are your thoughts on that now you said it yeah well i think it's this reliance on externalizing our happiness, freedom, peace. We are in such a state of cope, copium. We literally take, <laughs> it's like what we do is our form of copium. Um, and the shift really happens when you realize that there is no external source that is as powerful as your internal source. And that fundamentally your reality is created inside of you. And most people are living to escape their reality. When the hidden treasure really is in coming back to it and in mm -hmm. embracing what you have, you know, no matter how ugly it is, because that's the challenge. That's almost, that is the leap of faith is can you accept what is and can you have the unbearable compassion to accept you know your ugliness other people's ugliness and when that happens the ugliness in a sense becomes a form of beauty because you realize that everything is an expression of life and you don't say to the tall tree or to the short tree, you know, you're, you're too short to be qualified as a tree. You're too, mm -hmm. you know, you, we don't, we don't, we don't make these blanket statements to nature. You know, we, we revere nature because of its, of how freely it expresses itself. You now nature mm -hmm. is the embodiment of freedom of expression and mm -hmm. we're so caught up trying to control what expressions are allowed and what isn't that we forget mm -hmm. that how much suffering um, we self-impose mm -hmm. I have a question. So you're saying that's true with nature, right? It's like nature, if we look at nature, it, it expresses itself freely, like in a tree, right? It, it, it's each tree has their own shape, right? Like they don't, it's not like every tree looks identical, right? Um, so there's definitely an aspect to us, right? Uh, uh, I mean, we are part of nature, right? Or we have, we share a lot of commonalities with nature, right? Um, however, here's my question to you. I think that the biggest difference that sets us apart from nature is, is morality. What are your thoughts on that? Morality. No, that's another one. 
um, in psychological theories, there's different stages. So psychologists have theorized different stages of morality. Um, I don't remember the exact names of, of the stages, but there's like some form of like pre-morality and then conventional morality. And there's one that's post-morality. So it's funny because even, even scientists have classified a sense of, you know, morality that goes morality. beyond morality. Um, mm -hmm. Morality can be the cause of a lot of wars and a lot of killing and a lot of conflict because it's living in this world of duality, you know, right and wrong. Mm -hmm. It's good and evil is, it's tough to say this because it's like, well, it's rape. Rape can't be right. You know, killing pregnant women can't be right. All of this is fucked up and just fucked. It can't be. So it's like, mm -hmm. I was going to say that morality is a human mental construction that's a tough one so you don't so you don't believe in an objective morality then i don't believe in a rigid dogmatic sense of it like i think mm. i think when you're in a headspace where you're clear and calm violence and killing is just not something that that ever is a plausible action to take but I think mm -hmm. people can become so justified in their morality. Well, it's like, why, why do religions fight wars to kill each other? You can become mm -hmm. so almost blindsided by your own and you'll justify it by calling it morality. That So, so right. I'm just saying that morality has its blind spot of its danger there because you can justify mm -hmm. killing under morality the same way as you can, you can run that Renou renounce killing under morality so i think it's a really slippery slope because religions all throughout history and political parties have used morality as a right. reason under virtue to exactly exactly violence under virtue and this yeah. is the whole idea of this ego and this is what the Tao Te Ching, um you know great virtue doesn't know itself as virtue Right, because it's it's the ego trying to be virtuous, trying to be right, trying to control. Mm -hmm. And when you let go of this whole idea of virtuousness, it's ironic, but in, in that sense, you your virtue is virtue because it doesn't need to be virtue. Mm -hmm. It's like trying to be good does does a good person do they try to be good or is goodness their natural state of being you know you might say a bad person might try to be good because he has to try to be good in order to do the action of what might constitute goodness i think mm -hmm. i think the distinction is whether you are acting from a place of internal alignment or from a place of external or from a place of just showing the appearance of something. It's like, it's like people wanting to get super rich and, you know, on the surface, they have Bugattis and, and mansions extra on the surface, on the appearance side, but internally, well, maybe they feel happy. Maybe they feel fucking fantastic, but also maybe, they feel completely empty inside. I think the tricky, I think with morality, you have to feel it internally rather than just try to act it virtuously on the external, even though on the inside, it's not your, your natural inclination. This is a whole mind fuck. This is, this is getting complicated here.
I'm jumping all over the place. No, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm just, to me, the question is like, where does that come from? Like, because we all have that kind of instinct, right? It's like, most of us will perceive murder as wrong, right? Um, so that, I don't know, that just makes me feel like there's there's something there. It's like, what, what? I think love, when it comes down to it, love is the guidance, the only guidance we need. And that sounds corny as fuck in a sense. <laughs> love like when you're in your judgmental when you're in your judgmental state of mind it doesn't make sense you know how could love be the answer you know love just gets stomped mm -hmm. on by by violence you know if you love someone who wants to kill you they're does. gonna kill you yeah yeah but the, the tricky part is that love is when other people don't feel love, it leads them to do all kinds of things. But love, in, in, in a sense, is disarming mm -hmm. because if you're able to love someone in their ugliness, they, they, they almost, they break out of it. They break out of, they break out of their character and they see for the first time that maybe like, you know, I'm accepted for who I am and in my ugliness. And that, I think that sparks a fundamental change because mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's repulsive when we're told who we should be and it makes us rebellious to that. Mm -hmm. But when, when we feel accepted for the first time, and I don't think many of us feel fully accepted because we we're so, caught up by because we've been trained by parents and society to be to behave in a certain way or else you'll be unloved that's so that's putting conditions on love so then now we're getting into right. the whole conditional unconditional love conditional thing. yeah 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 damn love th this is a big topic it is it is reaching the near near the end of this episode yeah. maybe I we can talk we'll about that an next hour episode today. I think we'll just do an hour mm -hmm. today yeah we'll i agree to too long. before so we were about to stem to that love topic right but instead of going towards that direction i want to bring it back to objectivity right so we were talking about objective more morality right or uh, objective subjective morality right there what morality is right what about when it comes to objective truths do you believe in objective truths objectivity i don't think there's an actual thing as objectivity because that everything is subjective it just depends where you stand so to science their findings are objective but you're, you're standing right. from the standpoint of of science where you take certain presumptions to be true and then you right. base those certain true pres presumptions then to call this an objective fact. But like everything right. is relative. It depends where you stand. <laughs> um, because we have to describe one thing in relation to another. So if you're standing here and you're describing this mm -hmm. object, then yes, this is objectively mm -hmm. true. And if the object moves, then you might say that you're still describing the same object. But what if you move mm -hmm. and you're suddenly here and you describe this object? It sounds very abstract and metaphysical, but <laughs> it's like, where do you stand in your beliefs is what you will see as objective. Mm -hmm. And We try our best to make things objective, but as long as we don't become blindsided, I don't, I don't think 
there's a true objectivity because we are all subjective expressions. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll just give a stupid example. Like, uh, I've always been, been curious about the, you know, like basketball or any kind of sport. It's like, what dictates, wh what dictates that a, a team wins? Because it's set by a time limit. And, you know, you could be, you could end the game at 60 minutes and one team is the winner. You add another 10 seconds and the other team is the winner. So it's, it's arbitrary in the sense of like, you know, when do you cut off the, the, the times allotted for the game, right? Um, because you could keep, you could extend the game another 30 seconds. The outcome could change. You could extend it by another 10 minutes. You could, extend, like I said, where do you draw the line? And I think the other thing with like, um, even a sport like, like a uh, hundred, no, not a hundred meter sprint, but like the, the, the ones around the track, you know how like mm -hmm. the lanes, the lanes, they, they stagger them so that the, the relay races, right? Yeah. But it's like, this is just my head thinking, but like the, they have to turn at different angles yeah. across the track. And if you're turning at different angles, that affects how you run. But so how is that objective? How is that fair? You know, we try our best to make things fair, but nothing is truly honestly fair. Right. We could get, this but wouldn't is you say that, <laughs> but wouldn't you say that's an objective truth? For example, all humans, I'm just making statements here, right? But all humans want love, right? Um, life is unfair, right? It's full of like, full of unfair, full of suffering, right? Wouldn't you say those claims are objectively true? Like, does it, doesn't that claim encompass everyone in the world globally? Even if, whether, like, even if we have different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different parts of the world, different culture, tradition, those claims still hold truth. That's, I, I do agree with subjective truth as well. I think there are subjective truths because we are all individuals and experience life differently and have different events happen to us that, you know, cause different ideas and experiences. But I also think there's like a set of objective truths as well. What are your thoughts on that? What might be called objective truths is our way of, of unifying our understanding. And that's not, a, not, it's not a bad thing because we have to make sense of the world somehow. And we, we need ways to, we need common ground to agree on things. Right. I agree with that too. I think when you realize that everything is relative and you can choose to believe what you want to believe consciously, you get to choose, then it suddenly becomes not so clear because you could say something like life is suffering or life has suffering as an objective mm -hmm. truth. Mm -hmm. And However, I don't think that makes it true for everyone because there's someone experiencing the world right now who doesn't feel that way, but it's like, how do you make something? I guess the question is, how do you make something objective? Object well, here's objectivity. Thing. My argument here is. Objectivity just depends on mm -hmm. subject, a collective sub subjective agreement. And then we call that objective. 
but there's bound to okay. be people who also disagree with what we call objective. So we're right. kind of what going back to true one, and though? false again. We're kind of going back to <laughs> But I, I still believe there there's certain claims that have to be objective truths. For example, like this one, I'm like 100% confident is object, an objective truth. You could disagree with it, but we're all going to die. That statement is, is that not an objective truth? It's like at that point, it doesn't matter like our, I guess in 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 this claim, it doesn't matter our our feelings or our subjective truth. Regardless of that, it's like we we're all temporarily here. Now, of course, we all have we all may have different beliefs of like what what happens right, what happens after, and all that. But it's like just that specific claim right there. It's like no no human is escaping escaping that. You know, um, would that not be an objective truth? Yes, it would be. What is my point I'm trying to get at? Something can be objective, but then mm -hmm. that objectivity almost doesn't matter because you can only interpret it subjectively. Hmm. So, so the objective truth that we're all going to die is going to mean something completely different to you than it is going to mean to me, even though that is an objective statement. Mm -hmm. So it's like we experience the objectivity in our own subjective way. I think that mm -hmm. was, so I think that's, that, that summarized it because I was trying to find my way to, to express it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I see what you're saying. I, I mean, bringing it back to, um, the statement life has suffering, right? That statement in itself, I believe is an objective truth, right? It's like no human escapes suffering. We're all going to have our obstacles, our, our uh, life is like this, right? It's not all sunshine and rainbows, but the subjectivity comes where how each of us experience or, uh, what is it? Interpret, I guess, suffering differently, right? Because, for example, someone who, with who at, uh, follows more like stoic principles, right? They don't really see suffering as a negative thing, right? Like their their mental framework for suffering is a lot different. Uh, maybe a Christian's framework is like also different, right? But and then there might be people who who get very like depressed during a suffering. A moment of suffering in life right my point is it's like there's so many um ways to experience suffering right but i right. still think the, the statement holds true right it's like life has suffering but then it's what you're saying it's like um there's a there's a component of subjectivity to it too i guess maybe you can't even unattach both of them it's like maybe they're kind of like parallel in a way. Yeah. I kind of get what you're saying. In a sense of you can't, it's a tough one. you can't, you can't detach the two. They almost, they come with each other. Okay. Well, I guess we, we did a roundabout way, but this is the principle of yin and yang, right? The whole the Taoism of, of, of the, the positive and the negative pole. You, in the world of duality, mm -hmm. you, you need objectivity and subjectivity. They create each other. Um, mm -hmm. Right creates wrong, tall creates short, you know, fat creates skinny. They're all this, they're all opposite poles, but fundamentally, I, uh, it added source. They are one unified. The mother of all things, the mother of 10,000 things. Mm -hmm. So this is a good place to end it. Yeah, I think so. All right. How do you want to wrap it up? So <laughs> this was our first 
pilot episode we kind of are just figuring it out as we go along but hope you enjoyed that and peace out peace out <laughs> have a good rest I don't know of your week I, guys we'll, we'll get better with the intros in the beginning <laughs> yeah 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 we'll figure it out we'll, we'll figure something catchy <laughs>